anything like me, you were up late last night wondering if we're going to get any snow. And uh, we actually do. We actually do have some snow. It's called rain. That's the, <laughs> that's the southern snow. You know, like no matter what they say, um, you know, they say we're going to get snow. Um, it usually ends up being rain. And so I've taken to calling it the southern snow. Maybe you can go outside and put some water in a, in a, you know, a little balloon and write snowball on it and throw it at each other. It would be the equivalent. Um, so thank you all uh, for being here. And, and uh, you know, there is still potential of snow, and so we're, we won't delay um, much longer. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's, let's before we uh, read the passage, let's ask the Lord to illumine our hearts and minds. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for uh, today, because this is the day that you have made, and we as your people ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Moreover, Father, we ask now that as we have come into this place to worship and to hear from you, we pray that you might um, open our hearts and minds to the teaching of your word. I pray that um, there might be something that is said that awakens us spiritually, that provides food for our soul, and that as we leave, we consider what you have said. And so, in order to do that, we need the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, o Holy Spirit, come and do just that. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hear now the word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11 through verse number 21. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to, that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be called the righteousness of God. The law of flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen and amen. And in the month of January, we're going to be looking at our mission, vision, and values. And we're going to use four words um, to describe who we are as a congregation.
congregation, who the elders desire for us to be. The first of those words uh, is worship, and we looked at that last week, and we said worship is at the core of what we do here. We worship by the book. In other words, we worship according to the word of God. And one of the things we said in addition is that worship is a life reorienting experience. When you come into worship, it, it is supposed to completely change your heart and your mind. That's what it's designed to do. And therefore, we come into worship expecting to be confronted by Almighty God, His holiness, His glory, His power, His beauty, and His majesty. And that has a powerful impact on us. That's what we looked at last week. This week, we're going to look at transformation. How is it that we are transformed by the gospel? Now, look in your passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is probably the most uh, complete passage in talking about gospel transformation. And it shows the heart of the Apostle Paul, not just for the church at Corinth, but for all of us in this room. What does Paul desire for you and me? In fact, more important, what does Jesus Christ desire for you and me? He desires transformation. Look at verse number 17. Paul says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. In fact, in the, in the original Greek, it says if anyone is in Christ, new creation. That's it. There's a new creational reality. All things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's a wonderful verse because it says at root, the gospel or the heart of, at the heart of the gospel is transformation. That you and I are changed as a result of the proclamation of the gospel and as a result of being in Christ. Well, how do we know that to be the case? Well, look at verse number 21. What do we need for gospel transformation to happen? What do we need for gospel change to happen? We need a great exchange. Verse number 21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that, we, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now what Paul is saying here is astounding. Because he says in order for us to be changed, for all of, all of for us to be transformed, there needs to be a great exchange. Our sin, our unrighteousness, needs to be put on Christ, and then in exchange, we get his righteousness. That's a wonderful and profound change. I remember when I was younger, my, I had an older brother. He's much older than I. He's about six or so years older than me. And I remember growing up, he used to say, hey, Dennis, um, why don't you give me a quarter for a dollar? And of course, I didn't know what money was. And some of you have probably played that trick on your siblings. I had no concept what money was. And so every time we made an exchange, I was always on the losing end. But brothers and sisters, according to verse number 21, we're on the winning end of God's exchange. Because instead of us getting unrighteousness, we take, uh, Christ takes all of our unrighteousness, all of our sin on himself, and he gives us his righteousness so that we might be transformed in our being. That's the power of the gospel. Now, let me say this as well. Embedded in verse 21 is a vision of humanity that is diametrically opposed to the world. See, in, in our society, there are two ways of looking at humanity. The first is this. Most people in our society, when they look at man, they think man is basically good and all we need is a little help, right? You see this everywhere. Recently, um, I, I was listening to Joe Rogan. Now I know, I know, Joe Rogan is not uh, the best person for me to be listening to. He swears up and down and does a lot of uh, questionable things. But one of the reasons why I listen to Joe Rogan is this. 180 million plus people a week listen to Joe Rogan. Now, some of those are duplicates, I get. 
But the thing about Joe Rogan is he has the air of the culture. And more than that, he brings on people who represent the culture. And one of the things that Joe Rogan is obsessed with on his podcast is finding out how people are transformed. How do we get people to change? Constantly, if you listen to Joe Rogan, that's what he's after. How do we get people to transform? How do we get people to change? And recently, he had a man on there, and the man said this. He said, I know how we can transform our society through education. He said, what we do is we need to turn everybody into engineers and teach everybody how to code, and that would solve all of our problems. Now, we have a few people inside here who are engineers and, and know how to code well, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, I can tell you this. They will never teach me how to code. I've tried it. It is complex. It is difficult. Um, Russ Lynch, do you think they could teach you how to code? Sure. Sure. Right? Say again? My executive assistant does that, right? All right? There's some of us inside here today, we'll probably never learn how to code. And some of us may not have the capacity to become an engineer, but that's his grand plan for the world. Teach all of us how to become engineers and code. And then he's, what he said at the end was, was quite funny as well. Because he says, once we do that, we'll create robots that will do everything for us, and all we get to do is hang out by the beach and uh, paint or be creative. And I was like, ah, that's an awful existence. I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with painting. I'm no good at it. I'm no good at the arts, period. But that's a story for another time. But here's the point that I want to make. Why did that man say education and becoming an engineer and learning how to code is fundamental to changing and transforming society? Because in his view, man just needs a little help to get over the hump. And believe it or not, that is the vision or that is the belief of most people in our society. We're not that bad. All we need is a little education, a little culture. All we need is to be nice to one another. All we need is a life hack. And then we can change and have a transformed culture. What does Paul say? Paul gives us a different vision of humanity. He said, man is a desperate sinner in need of redemption. And unless our sin is taken care of, there's no hope for transformation. That's why he says, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Your problem isn't that you don't have enough education. Your problem isn't that you don't have enough culture. Your problem isn't that you're not nice enough. Your problem is that you're a sinner. And you're in desperate need of redemption. And... Uh, I think in the 11th century, there was a, a bishop. Um, his name is Anselm of Canterbury. And, and he wrote a book called Curdeus Homo, Why the God-Man. Anybody ever read that book? I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It's one of those technical books you just have to read in seminary. But, but the good part about that book is this. Anselm is talking about, or he's talking to his interlocutor. His name is Bozo. I don't know if that's where they got Bozo the clown from, but, but he was being pretty clownish in there. And he was asking Anselm a question. Why did Christ have to die? He, he said, when Adam and Eve sinned, why couldn't Adam just say, hey, God, my bad, not a big deal? And why couldn't God just forgive him? You know, if Adam was basically good, then sin is just a faux pas, not a big deal. Why did, why did Christ have to come and die in order to deal with that sin? And Anselm was giving him a few answers. You know, of course, you know that sin has to be atoned for. And he kept saying, well, why God couldn't just forgive by divine fiat? And he kept going on and on, to which Anselm finally said, beloved, you have not yet understood the gravity See, the problem with our society and the people in it 
is they haven't come to grips with the reality that they are sinners. And they're in need of transformation and redemption that only the gospel can provide. You know, Augustine spent the latter part of his life arguing with, um, with Pelagius over the same issue. Is man basically good and all we need is a little help? Or is man rotten to our core and in desperate need of redemption? And Augustine says, absolutely, we're rotten to our core in needs of redemption. And there's no other way we can be transformed apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds. If you're sitting down here today and you see any measure of transformation in your life, it is because of the power and the work of Jesus Christ in your life. Nothing else. Because that's what the gospel is for. The gospel isn't to make you nice. The gospel isn't to make you kind. The gospel isn't designed to make you a better person. The gospel isn't even designed to make you wealthy or healthy, like, like some people in our society say. The gospel is designed to deal with your most fundamental problem, and that is your a sinner. Now, I have some good news for you. I know that was a lot of bad news, but I have some good news for you. Here's the good news. Once you are in Christ, transformation is inevitable. It will happen. That's the power behind these verses. That's what Paul principally wants us to know. Now, the rest of this passage, and for the rest of our time, I want to take some time to unpack what a transformed life looks like. Now, you'll notice in this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21, as I was reading it, there were a number of therefore statements. In fact, there are five of them. There are five therefore statements that are all through this passage. In verse number 11, in verse number 14, in verse number 16, in verse number 17, in verse number 20. And if you, if you were to study them out, you'll notice this beautiful chiasm And they tell you what the transformed life actually looks like. What does it mean to be transformed? What does it mean to be changed by the power of the gospel? Those five therefore statements tell us that. And I'm going to look at each one very briefly. And what that means when a pastor says very briefly, it means he has no idea how long it's going to take, but he's kind of going to go as fast as he can. Okay? That's what it means. A little pastor hack there for you. So let's take them one by one. And each one shows us a unique lesson. First of all, in verse number 11, the transformed life is a life that often takes us outside of our comfort zone. Notice again, verse number 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Now, the word persuade there is an interesting word that Paul uses. Because that is completely antithetical to who Paul is. The word persuade here means to use eloquence and lofty speech to get people to believe what you want them to believe. That's not the Apostle Paul. If you read through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, listen to these statements by the Apostle Paul. He says, for Christ, this one is from 1 Corinthians 1.17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with eloquent words of wisdom. Then in 1 Corinthians 10.10, he says, For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but his physical presence is unimpressive, and his speaking is of no account. Literally, it means when Paul speaks, nobody understands him, and very little people listen. And then in 2 Corinthians 11.6, it said, I may be unskilled as as a speaker, but I'm not lacking in knowledge. In fact, Paul was such an unimpressive uh, uh, speaker, such a boring speaker, that he killed someone by his preaching. Acts 20, poor Eutychus was trying to listen to Paul, and he couldn't follow him, and he fell asleep, and he fell down and died. You know, as a preacher, (laughs) if I'm preaching, and somebody falls asleep and dies, I'm done. I got to tell you that that'll break me. But that was Paul. Now you have to ask yourself the 
important question. If Paul is that bad a speaker, if Paul is so awful at communicating God's word outwardly, why would he constantly put himself in position to speak? Here's the lesson for it. It's because when you're transformed by the gospel, you find a way to tell others, even if it lies outside of your comfort zone. You know, I've been a pastor a long time, and one of the reasons why people talk about why they don't share their faith is usually because they're not comfortable doing it. They don't feel they can speak properly. They feel awkward. They start to sweat. They think they're going to be embarrassed. There's all sorts of reasons that people give because they're just not comfortable. And I get it. There are times when we're in situations where we just don't feel comfortable. But look at Paul. Paul says, knowing therefore the, the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Paul is saying, I talk to people even though I'm awful at it because I've been transformed. And I want others to be transformed as well. And so he finds a way. Now look, I know some of you inside here today, it's actually beautiful to watch you because you do a bunch of stuff outside of your comfort zone. As I've gotten to know you over the years, there's some of you, you don't like being in crowds. And yet I see you in the midst of crowds trying to serve the Lord. That's the evidence of the transformed life. But there are some of us inside here today that need to get outside of our comfort zone. That need to lay aside the fact that we feel like we're not good enough or we can't speak well enough. Or we don't know enough about scripture. We need to get outside of that comfort zone in order to serve the Lord. Why? Because you've been transformed. Paul's ministry was so successful not because he had the ability to persuade others, but he was willing to persuade others. Do you hear the difference? Do you hear the difference? There is a big difference between being able to do something because you have ability and having the desire to do something even though you don't have that ability. That's the evidence of the transformed life. You step out of your comfort zone in order to serve the Lord. Well, let's look at the next, therefore. It's found actually in verse number 14 and 15. That the transformed life changes who you live for. Uh, Paul says here in verse number 14 and 15, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. So the point that Paul is making here is that if Jesus Christ died for at least some of us, he died for all of us who name the name of Christ. Then he unpacks that in verse 15. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves or on behalf of themselves, but on behalf of him who for their sakes died and was raised again. The impetus or the power or the energizing of Paul's ministry happens as a result of what Christ has done for him. He never forgot that. And he made it his mission to live for Christ because Christ died on his behalf. Os Guinness, who is a, a Christian um, author and social critic, once told a story I'll never forget. I was trying to remember where I found it, but the, the story just stuck out to me. He, he talked about uh, the, when the Soviet Union was at the height of its power, when it controlled every aspect of its society, they wanted to crack down on Christianity. So they sent the KJV out to all of the churches, even the house churches, to spy on the Christians there. And one day a KJV officer, he was a young guy, he went into one of these house churches and he saw a woman worshiping and crying and weeping in front of a statue and kissing the feet of Jesus. Now, I don't recommend that as a form of worship. I'm just relaying the story that Oskin has told. And so Oskin has says, here it is. She's pouring out and showing worship and love for Jesus Christ. And the young KJB officer came to this old woman 
and say, my grandmother. Are you also prepared to kiss the feet of our beloved General Secretary of the Communist Party? To which the woman quickly replied, oh yes, absolutely, but only if you crucify him first. <laughs> oh man, I wish I had her wit. Only if you crucify him first. Why would she say that? Because only someone who crucified on your behalf is worthy of your adoration. That's the only person that's worthy. There's a lot of people and a lot of things that vie for our worship. Money, success, power. But there's only one that died for you in your place. And that woman was right. If that young KGB officer wanted her to worship the general secretary of the Communist Party, then they better get to crucifying him on a cross, putting him in a tomb, and then looking for him to be raised in three days. Because only a person like that is worthy of your complete and utter devotion. And that he died for all. On your behalf. On your behalf. Therefore you live on his behalf. I remember um, I was a student in, in seminary and I was studying Greek. And, you know, when you study Greek, th there's always like a million prepositions. At least it felt that way. At least it felt that way. So what I would do is I would grab all these little cards and I would write the prepositions on there. And I would constantly be going through them. And there's a few of the prepositions I had a huge time remembering. And one of the prepositions is actually found in this passage. And it's the preposition who care. On behalf of. And as I was flipping through these cards, trying to remember that, there's no way I could remember it. And one day it dawned on me, on that one word, hang, the full scope of substitutionary atonement. On behalf of, who cares? Do you know the strangest thing happened? I never forgot that word again. Never forgot that word again. Beloved, if he died on your behalf, well, the least we can do is live on his behalf. That's what the transformed life calls us to do. Well, notice the third thing. The transformed life causes us to look at Christ and others differently. Uh, verse number 16. Paul says that from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ, according, according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Now, what is he talking about here? When Paul says we regard no one according to the flesh and not even Christ, he's not saying that they don't care about others or Christ. What he's saying here is we look at people differently now that we have been transformed by the gospel. We look at people completely differently. You know, sometimes in, in a sermon or it's, you know, I'm preaching now, a pastor will say something that's not for the congregation but just for himself. I do that from time to time. You know, I'll put little things in my sermon that's just for me and no one else. That's my way subtly of preaching to myself. Another pastor ha um, hack there, right? Because sometimes when you're speaking to other people, you could sometimes think this is for them and not for you. Well, so what I do is I build something into the sermon where I know this is for you, Dennis. So pay attention to yourself lest you fall asleep. It's possible. I've seen people talking and almost fall asleep. Verse number 16 is just for the Apostle Paul. It's just for the Apostle Paul. You see, when Paul was unconverted... Paul looked at Gentiles as dogs, pets. When Paul was unconverted, he looked at Christians as heretics and blasphemers. 
when Paul was unconverted, he looked at Jesus Christ as a failed insurrectionist. But when Paul, on the road of Damascus, encountered the living God, his life completely changed. Completely changed. And instead of being objects of scorn, Gentiles became objects of grace. And Christians, instead of being heretics, became saints and brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus Christ, instead of being a failed insurrectionist, became his Lord and Savior. There's a complete change in perspective when you and I become believers and we're transformed by the gospel. We can't look at people the the same. And we certainly don't look at Christ the same. That's a mark of the transformed life. We look at people differently. They don't become annoyances. They don't become objects to our success. They become people in need of a savior, brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, notice the the fourth thing quickly. The fourth thing is this. If we are transformed people, we need to live like it. In verse number 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Notice what is the agent of transformation in this passage. It's in Christ. Notice Paul doesn't say, If any man be in church, or if any man be in a Christian family, or if any man be in academia or education, No, it's if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Why is that the case? Because Christ is the ultimate transformative thing or agent, as it were. Now, there are so many examples in Scripture, but I'm just going to give you one because it's my new favorite. Um, Recently, I've been studying the life of Zacchaeus. You know, everybody's playing the song now in the 90s. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a... Yeah, we little man with you. I, I heard the song, and I, you know, I, I need to study Zacchaeus. And, and you know what you do? If you, if you want to study Va- Zacchaeus, study Zacchaeus alongside the rich young ruler. It's a fascinating study. You see, both of them were Jews steeped in the law. Both of them were wealthy. Both of them defrauded people for money. Both of them had enough sense to come and see Jesus. But that's where the comparisons end. Because when they finally encountered Jesus, one of them was transformed and the other was left untransformed. What did Zacchaeus do when he finally came in contact with Jesus? His life was transformed. He became a new creature. I could imagine Zacchaeus going and knocking on somebody's door said, hello, uh, Mrs. Hezekiah, how are you? It's like, Zacchaeus, you just, just came and got your taxes the other day. He says, I know, I know, I'm not here to take from you. I'm actually here to give you back all the back taxes um, I stole from you. And she couldn't believe it. She's like, what? Are you serious? He's like, yes. It's like, well, what? What happened to you? You're a thief and a scoundrel. He was like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but I heard that Jesus was coming, and, um, and I wanted to see him, and so I, I kind of ran up the tree. It's kind of steep. There ain't any kids to it. But, but then I saw him, and I met him, and my life hasn't been the same. And he probably looked at Mrs. Hezekiah and said, I'd love to stay and tell you more, but I got a lot of people to see and a lot of money to give back. But see, that's that's what happens when your life is transformed by the power of the gospel. You go from being a taker to a giver. You go from being a scoundrel to being a saint. Only the gospel can do that. Now, nobody really remembers the rich young ruler. In fact, one of the saddest epitaphs you can put on anybody's life is seeing um, after he walks away from Jesus, the Bible says he walks away sad. And, and, you know, a sad existence awaits the life of the one 
to ignore anything. I'm not saying that to be mean. That's just the fact that the Bible presents it. Now, I got to say one more thing before I'm done. So many of us in this building uh, name the name of Christ. And as a pastor, I get asked the question all the time, if I am a Christian, if I am a new creation, if I've been changed by the gospel, pastor, why is it so hard for me to live like it? Why is it that I'm always sinning? Why is it that my Christian life is such a struggle? Why is it that I can't have the victory over my sin? Well, this passage, verse number 17, actually speaks to that. Notice it again. It says, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. Hear me. I'm going to give you a little English lesson. Relax. It's simple English, but you know it. The first part of this verse, the old has passed away, that's a past tense verb. And what Paul is trying to say that if you are in Christ, your sins have been taken away and dealt with. You've been redeemed. You have been given a new nature. That's a fact, and it's settled. But the next verb in this passage is a perfect tense verb. And the way a perfect tense verb uh, uh, works is this. A perfect tense verb indicates that an action that happens in the past has an ongoing impact on our lives now. So when you read in this passage that the old has passed, your nature has been taken away, behold, the new has come, what Paul is saying is right now, the work of Christ's redemption is having an impact on you as we speak. It's not completed. It's not done. The work of Christ is ongoing. That's why you still struggle with sin. But the good news about the perfect is this, that your change in Christ is inevitable. It will happen. It will happen. Whether you struggle with whatever sin, you struggle with the sin of anxiety, you struggle with the sin of pornography, you struggle, with, it doesn't matter the sin, lying, stealing, cheating. If you are in Christ, Paul is saying that the work of the Holy Spirit is having an impact on your heart and mind. It may be slow. You may be not able to see it, but it's being done. One scholar uh, calls it botanical growth. <laughs> you know, botanical growth is if you ever planted a tree and then you go outside, um, the next day when you come out, uh, if you just planted a tree, is it 10 foot tall? No. How long does it take to get 10 foot tall? Oh, it takes a long time. So the beauty of the gospel is that if you believe and you have faith, God promises to transform you. It might be slow, but it's inevitable. And not only will you grow, the Bible says, as you grow, you will bear fruit. That's the glory of transformation. Don't lose hope, Christian. Your transformation is inevitable. Now, what's the big takeaway? The big takeaway is simply this. You know, gospel transformation happens in gospel-rich communities. We need each other in order to be transformed by the gospel. We need to be praying for one another. We need to be building one another up. We need not to get frustrated if we see that someone isn't growing as fast as we want them to. We need to love and support one another. That's how we grow. That's how we grow as a community. That's how we grow individually. And that's how we ultimately transform our society. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, uh, gospel transformation is beautiful. And we are being transformed by the power of your gospel. Lord, I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Our growth feels stunted. Our growth feels at times, 
as if we're taking two steps back. Beyond that, Lord, we never feel like we're, we're getting anywhere. But as Paul says, if anyone be in Christ, new creation, the old has passed away, and all things are becoming new. Help us to rest in that glorious promise. In Jesus' name, amen.